Greetings to all of those that are in Nepal, as well as those that are joining us in other nations of the world. We are teaching today in a Bible school in Nepal, Ganj, Nepal, with Pastor Deepak, who is translating, and we will soon be having this with translation into the Nepali language. If you have friends who speak Nepali, it would be good to have them join us, but I want to greet all of you students. Good morning to you in Nepal. Good morning. Today, we are continuing on the subject that we already begun yesterday that brought that was not uh, broadcast live, but we will share today's program or today's teaching live. And we are talking about the characteristics of a godly leader. <laughs> And we chose to look at First Chronicles chapter 12 at David's army and the qualities that were in his army. David was forming his army, and there were there were people with very specific qualities or characteristics that were joining his army every day. They all had very specific characteristics, but when you took them all, they all had one particular quality, and that is that they were prepared for warfare. They were prepared for physical war, but we are part of God's army and we must be prepared for spiritual war. And so yesterday we spoke and we want to just review very quickly on the importance of being prepared for spiritual battle. We saw that we live in two worlds, the visible and the invisible. And we are engaged in an invisible war, which is a sp in the spiritual realm. And Paul, writing to the Ephesians in chapter 6, verse 10 and on, said, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. The way we can combat the devil is by being strong in the Lord. And then Paul tells us to put on the whole armor of God. And he tells us in verse 12 that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness 
in the heavenly places. In order for us to understand this a little better, we need to know that God is in heaven. But then there is a lower place called the heavenly places, which is the atmosphere over the earth. And so the devil is not where God is. The devil is over in this area around the earth after he was cast out of heaven. So Paul says that our battle is not a physical battle against human beings. And in 2 Corinthians 10, four, uh, 3 and 4, he tells us that though we are in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. And he says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. So if we are in a spiritual battle, we need spiritual armor. Now, as we looked into the subject, we noted that our enemy is the devil. And he is mentioned 140 times in the Bible. Jesus referred to him, mentioned him 25 times. Now, what we also noted is that the devil, he was a high-ranking angel or a cherub in heaven at one point. But he rebelled against God and he was cast out of the presence of God, cast out of heaven. One third of the angels followed him. Now, we talked yesterday about the fact that uh, when you have a lion, a, a real lion, uh, he does not work alone. He has a pride. And the lion sends out his pride to catch the weak prey. And 
we explained yesterday that the devil is not equal to God. And he does not have power equivalent to God's. And we know that Jesus Christ defeated the devil. Now, the devil could only be in one place at one time. And so most of the time when you are in spiritual battle, you're not fighting against the devil himself, but one of his demons or one of those fallen angels. Now, you need to know very clearly that your enemy is the devil. Not your enemy is not a believer from a different church or denomination. Unfortunately, sometimes Christians waste time arguing or fighting with other Christians over some difference in understanding rather than fighting the devil. The devil would like to divide us, so we fight each other instead of fighting him and winning souls to Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus said in John 10.10 10, that the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. So that is one way we know that something is from the devil. If it steals, it kills or destroys, it is not from God. Now, Peter said that he comes like a roaring lion. So, but you see, that is one of his tactics is to put fear on you by causing noise or trying to make a problem look bigger than it is. We examined yesterday that the devil tries to keep people in spiritual blindness. By blinding their spiritual eyes. So it is a good idea before you witness to someone that you pray for them, that God would remove that blindness from their spiritual eyes. It 
in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, Paul said, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. In Luke chapter 8, Jesus talked about the sower sowing the word. In Luke chapter 8, Jesus talked about the sower who went out to sow seeds to plant. And he explained here that the devil comes to try to rob, to steal that seed that is sown. Let's read Luke chapter 8, verse 12. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear, then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Uh, so Jesus said that this is sowing the word of God in the devil could tries to take away that seed so the person would not be saved. So when you go out to your towns and villages and begin to preach the gospel, the devil will try to distract people so they don't listen to you, first of all. And if they hear the gospel, then he tries to somehow take it away, put doubt in their hearts. Another way that the devil works is he tries to subvert the plans of God. And he has been doing this ever since the fall of man. And the devil tries to subvert the plan of God for your life. Pardon? The devil tries to subvert the plan of God for your life. Jesus, when God had called, when he was about to begin his ministry, after that the Holy Spirit descended on him, he was taken into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights okay. where he fasted. If Jesus was tested, you will be tested. If 
And after not eating for 40 days and 40 nights, the devil shows up to tempt him. And he says, well, if you're the son of God, why don't you command these stones to become bread? And notice what happens when Jesus is tested. Pardon? Notice how Jesus responded when he was tested. Jesus used the word of God. And he said to the devil, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, you notice that Jesus knew God's word and he used God's word against the devil in that moment of testing. Then the devil tries to tempt him in other ways. And again, Jesus says, it is written. He quotes the scriptures. And at one point, the devil takes him to a very high place there in Jerusalem. And he says, look at all these kingdoms of the world. I will give them to you if you will bow before me. You see, he was trying to subvert the plan of God. He did not want Jesus to defeat him on the cross. And so he's offering these kingdoms to him by offering a shortcut. Just bow before me and I'll give them to you. You don't have to go and do what you're going to do. But what we must notice how important it is to use God's word when we are tested. Now, as we continue, yesterday we pointed out that the devil is not omniscient. He is not everywhere present. He is only in one place at one time. When Jesus was on earth, he too was only in one place at one time. But he said to the disciples, it is better that I go to the Father because I will send you another comforter, the Holy Spirit. So when, 
When Jesus was on earth, you had to find where he physically was because he was limited by his physical body of being in one place at one time like we are. But the Holy Spirit is everywhere. The Holy Spirit is right there in Nepal where you are sitting and studying in Bible school. The Holy Spirit is right here where I am at. God is present everywhere. We call that God is omnipresent, but the devil is not. God is omniscient, which means he knows everything. The devil is not omniscient. He does not know everything. God is omnipotent. The devil is not. Jesus said, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. And then he commanded the disciples to go and preach the gospel. And we saw from 1 John 4, 4, that he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. Jesus is in you. He is in me and he is greater than the devil who is in the world. So we know the devil is sneaky, he's crafty, he comes to kill, to steal, to destroy. And so that is why Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 6 to put on the whole armor of God. And he tells us to put on the, the to, to be girded with truth, to be covered with truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. The devil is a liar. He's the father of liars. He is a deceiver. And sometimes even believers are frightened or deceived by the devil's tactics. But we are not ignorant of the devil's tactics. So we put on or we are girded with truth. We put on the breastplate of righteousness. So first of all, we have truth. Jesus Christ said, I am the way. 
the truth and the life. And to protect our hearts, we have the breastplate of righteousness or a right standing before God. You see, if you are, if you were to appear before a king, you could not just walk in and talk to him. You had to have the right standing to be able to come before that king. We could not stand before God with sin in our lives. God is a righteous God, and sin cannot exist in his presence. But when we receive the forgiveness that Jesus Christ offers us, the blood of Jesus Christ washes away all of our sins. And we are justified before God. Oh. We are justified before God. We are as we appear before God, not as a sinner, but as a saint now. As a child of God. Not because of what we did, but because of what Christ did on the cross. So we are no longer condemned because we have received the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. The devil may come and lie to you and tell you you were not forgiven or you're still a sinner. But you say, no, devil, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The Bible says that the devil is the accuser of the brethren. He comes to accuse, to condemn Christians. But we put on the breastplate of righteousness and we are protected from those attacks. Now, the, the continue on Paul says, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You see, if you are not active in ministry, if you are not active for the Lord, witnessing to other people, you have time, you, you 
put yourself in a place where the devil has more opportunity to affect your life. Uh, pardon? If a person is not actively witnessing, not actively talking to others about Jesus, like the Bible says, we should have our feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We need to be going and speaking and preaching the gospel of peace, the gospel of Jesus Christ to other people. Yes, laziness, idleness is not good because that is the devil's playground. If you're just sitting around not doing anything, your thoughts are running all over the place and the devil starts bringing different thoughts into your mind. That's why you need to be busy doing the Lord's work. Above all, verse 16, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked ones. Now, the shield of faith needs to be filled with God's word. We have seen pictures of Roman soldiers from the time of Jesus, the time of Paul. And the shield that they used on parades was just a small round shield, metal shield. But when they went to battle, they had a large wooden wooden shield, a shield made out of wood. Now they needed to wet that shield in water, soak it in water. Because when the enemy would shoot darts with fire, they would not cause that shield to light up on fire. Well, our shield, our spiritual shield, needs to be soaked in the water of the word. And if we are filled with God's word, then the for the darts, those doubt, that unbelief, those lies of the devil, they will not be able to affect us. And take the helmet of salvation, verse 17. You cannot stop thoughts from coming to your mind. Now, 
but you can refuse to allow them to stay in your mind. You cannot stop a bird from flying over your head. But you certainly can stop it from sitting on your head and making a nest. So different thoughts will come to you, but you must protect your mind. And then Paul says, um, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. You see, the sword is an offensive weapon. We use it to bring people to Jesus Christ. We attack the territory of the devil. By preaching the word of light, the word of the gospel of light. By preaching God's word, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. The word of God will pierce deep down between the soul and the spirit. When Jesus was tempted, he used the word of God. You need to immerse yourself in God's word. And when you are tested, when thoughts come from the enemy, you can reply, it is written. So learn to use God's word. Preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. And then in verse 18, Paul says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. You will not get very far without praying. The Bible here says to always, uh, pray always. Not just when you get in trouble, you have a need, but you should be in fellowship with God on a regular basis. Anything for me, so 
we will be examining the importance of prayer a little later in this in these lessons. But notice that Paul says here uh, mentions praying in the spirit. You see, you and I, we can pray with our understanding. Meaning you pray in Nepalese, or I pray in English, or in other language. Now, that's praying with your understanding. In other words, you're thinking of what you're going to say to God. But there is also prayer in the spirit. Those that are baptized in the Holy Spirit, they can pray to God in the language that the Holy Spirit has given them. And if you are not yet filled with God's Spirit, pray and ask God, and He will fill you with His Holy Spirit. God wants to fill you with your with His Holy Spirit. So prayer is important not only in our language, our native language, but also to pray in the language the Holy Spirit gives us. Sometimes we do not know how to pray about a need. And when we pray in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit helps us by praying according to the will of God. He gives us the words in an unknown language to say to God, requesting or praying for that need. Very well, let's go back now again to First Chronicles chapter 12. We are going to continue examining other qualities in David's army. The second quality that was important, and we find that in verse 30, was that they had courage. There were men of courage. We need to live by conviction and not by preference. We need to live by conviction and not by preference. In other words, Conviction is what you are willing to give your life for. Preference is just what you desire, what you choose. Unfortunately, many believers today, they live a cafeteria type of Christianity. They go in and they just choose what they like. 
Uh, I don't know if you have such restaurants in Nepal, but we have restaurants where you can go and choose certain foods. What you see, you choose. Yeah, there's cafeterias. Yeah, you follow also. So yeah. that's how some believers live. They just choose what they like from the Bible. What they don't like, they don't follow. It takes courage to preach the gospel. You may be the only one standing there preaching, and you may have people that are not so happy that you are doing that. And we see that David's army, David's men, they were courageous. They had conviction. They believed that David should be king. And they were ready to go to battle with him. The third quality that we notice in David's men there was a group called the sons of Issachar in verse 32 who understood the times. We're in, yes, we're in Second Chronicles chapter 12, and we're in verse 32. The sons of Issachar who understood the had an understanding of the times. We need to have an understanding of the times that we are living in. The secular world changes, the spiritual world changes. But we must never compromise our goals and the word of God. We may change our methods, but we do not change the message. In other words, today we have, today, for example, we have the opportunity to use technology like I am using right here to speak to you. I'm an American, you are in Nepal. If I were there in person, I would teach the same lesson that I'm teaching to you from far away. 
So the goal is the same, the message is the same, but the methods have changed. Number four, what of the qualities was they knew how to keep rank. They understood authority. Authority does not come from a title or position, but from godly character. The centurion who came to Jesus, he said that he had authority because he was under a higher authority. An army that is disorganized and does not know how to keep uh, uh, rank will be a very ineffective army. If soldiers do not understand authority, if they do not hold rank, you see there are generals, there are uh, sergeants, there are different positions, and there's this the regular soldier. Well, the regular soldier does not make the decision of a general. Otherwise, you'll have a mess. <laughs> The centurion who came to Jesus, he was over 100 soldiers. And they obeyed his commands. But they obeyed his commands because he was under a higher authority, the authority of Caesar. You have authority in Jesus Christ. But it is authority that you receive because you submit to his authority. You submit to his rulership. You submit to his lordship. Well, in the church, God has also placed people in authority. And if you want to be effective, you must be in submission to that authority in the church. If you, as a believer, as a member of the church, want to exercise certain authority, you must first submit to the authority that is over you in the church. We must respect those who are in leadership positions that God has placed over us. We must respect those that God has placed over us in authority, spiritual authority. 
आत्मिक अधिकार इसमें दिनों में एक उत्सव इसमें दिनों में एक अधिकार मां हनी रानु शिक्षु पर सा the opposite of authority is rebellion and rebellion if it is not dealt with it can cause a lot of damage in uh, Numbers chapter 16, we see that certain leaders rebelled against Moses. And as a result, a number of people also became rebellious. And God was not pleased and destroyed them. God is a God of plan and purpose and authority. Well, we will stop our lesson right here and continue on in the next lesson. And before we start the next lesson, I ask you to please reread First Chronicles chapter 12, starting with verse 22 until verse 38. Uh, for those of you. For those of you, I'm sorry, for those of you watching online, I'm Walter Zagarevich with Global Vision Ministries, and I am teaching a Bible school in Nepal. And thank you for joining us. We will be back on in just a few moments.